Hello, I'm David R. Jones of the Community Service Society. Welcome to the Urban Agenda. On today's edition of the Urban Agenda, we're talking about the massive increase in funding for the New York City school system. During the past several months, I have served as the co-chair of a special commission appointed by the New York City Council. The commission will recommend how billions of dollars as the result of a lawsuit should now be used to provide a quality education for all of our children. Joining me today are Melora Socket, the Deputy Director of the Special Commission, and Professor Luis Huerta from Teachers College of Columbia University, who is serving as an expert consultant on the legal case. Melora, can you tell our viewers just what this case is about and what the implications are? Oh, absolutely. This case was brought over 10 years ago. It was brought in 1993 by a consortium of parents and advocacy groups that worked with an umbrella organization called the Campaign for Fiscal Equity. And the suit is now called the Campaign for S Fiscal Equity Lawsuit, the CFE Lawsuit. Mm -hmm. And what is, um, distinguishes this case from other cases around the country is the case is known as an adequacy case not an equity case, meaning that the argument was that under the New York State Constitution, children in New York City were not receiving their right to a sound, basic education. And the case wound its way through the courts. In 2001, Justice Leland DeGrasse decided that the plaintiffs had indeed shown that New York City students were not receiving a sound, basic education. And unfortunately, that um, there was then an appeal which reversed that decision. But in 2003, the state's highest court agreed with DeGrasse and found that, yes, in fact, New York City students, they are entitled to a sound basic education and they're not receiving it. And the case is now, as you've heard most recently, been presented to a panel of referees. So, so basically the court found that uh, New York City children were getting shortchanged. Correct. It was ultimately, now it has to go back and decide it by how much. Is that essentially that it? That is essentially it. Right. Though a group of referees has recently come out with a figure. And it's likely that we're going to see somewhere around $5.6 billion. And that's strictly for operational costs. There'll be an additional sum for Just facilities. Just to give a, a parameters to people, what is the Board of Education's budget, if you know? At, yeah, uh, the, the Board of Education's current budget is approximately $12 billion. Per year. Per mm -hmm. year. So, so this, this would is be a very substantial increase. Very substantial. Professor, you know, obviously we're all waiting around. How do you see this uh, playing itself out? Do you have any sense of, uh, from the work you've done already in terms of the, how long this might take before we see these kinds of monies flowing out? I think one of the first things to uh, note is that this case is very unprecedented in a variety of factors. The most importantly, and that is that the judge uh, is in the position, Justice DeGrasse is in the position to order uh, the amount of revenues that should be spent on public schools in New York City uh, rather than the legislator deciding this, which has been the trend nationwide. Right. So that is something that is signaling a very important uh, change uh, in how schools are funded and all states are actually watching New York and what's happening here. As far as ultimately what can happen or what will happen in the several, next several months as we begin to debate uh, not only the council that you're a part of, uh, but with legislators and so forth as far as, as far as how the revenue will actually be um, or how the state will actually um, make this revenue to right. fund the schools. Uh, and this is a very important issue. Uh, will it require new tax increases? Will it uh, require supplanting existing funds? We are still not there and this is very important work. Uh, and lastly, how we're actually going to distribute these dollars and allocate these dollars to schools in New York City is, is a very important issue as well. Now, Melora, what, what about the commission that you and I both uh, serve with, you as deputy director, yeah. I as co-chair? What role does the city council have in this whole process? Well, the city council, David, has authority over the budget, meaning we, the city council can give a thumbs up or a thumbs down to the mayor's budget. 
So they have an invested interest in being sure that the money that's being that comes into the city is well spent and wants to develop the city council very much wants to formulate a plan that or wants its independent commission to formulate a plan that will meet the needs of students in a meaningful way. Mm -hmm. And do we have a sense, okay, we have a special group of special masters who have recently ruled. Uh, uh, when is uh, Judge DeGrasse supposed to come back with an ultimate ruling, and what will that ruling likely consist of? Uh, well, according to the rules that were set forth, the state has now, or the judge has 90 days to respond to um, the recommendations that have been made. Um, the likelihood is, since this was, uh, had already reached the appeals court at, at the state level, which is our highest court, um, and since the legislator um, allowed the deadline to um, pass, which is when the special masters were assigned to this task, um, the likelihood is that the Justice DeGrasse may actually rule in favor of what the masters have put forth. Um, again, he has the ability to change his mind. Though. And, and that would be essentially saying how much money would have to go from the state to the city. Uh, it wouldn't get to the question of how those monies would be spent. How? No, uh, it would. The justice would only um, um, agree with the plan that has been set forth. It is still up to the legislator on how the revenues actually, where the revenue is going to come from, um, as well as how it's going to be spent. Well, let, let's talk about the revenue. Five point six billion. Um, the state, uh, last time I looked, had about a six billion dollar structural deficit uh, going into the next fiscal year. Um, that could theoretically mean, though I think there's a phase-in process, a, a major new uh, revenue requirement for the state of New York. Uh, where would the money come from? The sources of the funds are being debated right now, and there are, some people talk about lottery dollars, some people talk about new tax increases, some people talk about a sales tax. Mm -hmm. Uh, there, the problem is right now that, as you mentioned, the state is having serious financial difficulties and is eliminating social services. And we he know that social services in New York City are extreme cuts are going to be taking place. So a major concern that I think everyone has is to be certain that the monies do not come at the expense of other services and that we're not robbing Peter to pay Paul. Well, particularly since the poorest students, obviously, if you, you start having social service cuts that are widespread, that mm -hmm. could be the sort of worst of all possible worlds. Sure, you have it on one hand, but if you take it away on the other, that could literally be a, a, a neutral impact. Mm -hmm. But let's talk about, uh, you know, it is called the Campaign for Fiscal Equity. Um, the question has already emerged in our hearings mm -hmm. and will likely have to be considered by the legislature. Uh, if this money's come down, uh, is it going to be spread equally uh, throughout uh, the city's education system? Um, should it go to very high-performing schools, or should it be targeted towards low-performing schools? Professor, do you have any attitudes on this uh, particular issue? I think it's important to note that um, in preparation and for the arguments for this case, the studies that were conducted, especially the AIR, which is a uh, American Institutes for Research, which is an institute that created a, or that conducted a very sophisticated study looking at what the needs are across the street and across the state and trying to estimate um, best practices and the revenue necessary for students to reach those best practices, um, that there's a significant amount of money that has to come down. However, it's not calling for an equal distribution of revenues across all schools, and that is that all schools are different, whereas all students are different. Some students in particular schools will require more revenue than others. Uh, the idea of deferential funding is going to have to be uh, the tantamount um, philosophy that's going to have to be followed here because we know that in New York City there's a variety of needs, which means that these deferential needs will have to be met by deferential funding. Well, the, the other thing you hear a lot, both in the hearing and externally, is, is the question of are we just going to pour monies, the huge amounts of monies now, into a system that is seriously flawed. Uh, on, the, on the far right, obviously, there's an argument that this is not about a money issue. I think the judge has already, and now the Court of Appeals have already ruled, they don't believe that the money doesn't matter. Uh, but there is the question of accountability. Uh, uh, there are serious problems with the city school system uh, that have been mentioned again and again. 
Um, how does this all mix into this? Malori, do you want to start well, with I know that the as accountability part of, issue? As part of our commission's work, we are spending a great deal of time thinking about how can we be sure that the money is making an actual difference in children's lives. And one of the ways to do that is to be sure that you have accountability throughout. And what I mean by that is you have accountability at all different levels within a system. You have structures in place to be sure that the strategies you've created are being analyzed to see that they are implemented appropriately. And you have structures in place to be sure that you are achieving the outcomes for children that you wanted to be achieving, meaning that you are seeing increases in achievement, you are seeing increases in attendance, you are seeing increases in graduation rates. Now obviously you have to be reasonable in your expectations. You're not going to see a uh, spike immediately, but what minimally what you can hope to <clears throat> see is improvement within a particular school. So mm -hmm. if you are investing dollars within a school, you have every right to expect that there should be maybe not an objective standard met within that school, but that that, that school is improving. Mm -hmm. We'll be right back to continue the urban agenda. Once you see the world through math and science, you'll never see anything the same way again. Go to girlsgotech.org. You'll see. We're discussing the court-ordered budget increase of several billion dollars uh, to the New York City school system. My guests are Melora Sockett, a policy analyst who is now Deputy Director of the New York uh, City Council Created Commission on the Implementation of the Campaign for Fiscal Equity Lawsuit, and Professor Luis Huerta from Teachers College of Columbia University, who serves as an expert consultant on the legal case. We were talking briefly in the first half about the issue of accountability. What about teacher accountability? It's been sort of the hobby horse of uh, conservatives and others. Um, how would we talk about this from, for instance, the uh, city council's per, uh, uh, perception and uh, position? Laura, do you have any idea of how that would go? Well, in terms of teacher accountability, I think that teacher accountability needs to go hand in hand with providing adequate supports to teachers. And that what is going on right now is that we have a teacher retention rate that is abysmal, meaning that we have 25% of our teachers um, leaving the school system and 18% only uh, after the first year. Mm -hmm. So the question is, how can we uh, retain our teachers and give them the supports that they need to stay in the classroom? And in terms of the accountability question in teachers, their teachers need to have access to data so that they can determine what's going on in the classroom for their students. Mm -hmm. And so that they can um, provide real-time responses to assessment information that they receive. Now, in terms of how to get people into the classroom and in the, terms of account... recruitment issue. Yeah. Right. That, that's, an, that's definitely, I think, a primary role of this commission is to figure out how to make that happen. And clearly one of the reasons we're having such recruitment uh, you know, trouble, I think this the court got right away, is the differential pay between New York City and its suburban neighbors. It's just huge. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, obviously I was he hearing numbers, uh, the, the, the spread can be as much as eight or nine thousand dollars difference uh, for people with similar credential. And that clearly is not acceptable and we're, we're showing signs of that. Mm -hmm. From a research perspective, is this, is this what's being found across the country? Is, is this uh, differential between inner cities or cities and their suburban neighbors? I think that's a common pattern that we see across cities, and that is the differential between suburban uh, teacher salaries and, and some of the inner city teacher salaries. Here in New York, uh, we know that the teacher salaries are tied in 
to the salaries that, of all public employees, and that's something that here the union has been very vocal about, and that is right. um, that teachers should not be uh, part of the uh, pay increases and so forth and benefits that all public employees receive, but rather be independent. Mm. As far as teacher quality and, and how this commission might address this with the new funding, that this is obviously a a very key issue, is especially if we're going to increase facilities and new classrooms and new, new schools and we're going to require uh, quite a few new teachers and administrators and New York City is already um, in a deficit of, of the necessary teachers and administrators to operate schools. Um, so this is something that's going to be uh, a, a very important and key thing to address quickly. It's interesting. I mean, we, we've talked about um, a little earlier about this question of equity. Uh, the chancellor uh, some uh, weeks ago just came out with a number uh, that he estimates that only 20 percent of the kids in the system will actually come out with a regent's degree. And that would include the specialized schools as well. Uh, that means that it includes Bronx Science, uh, you know, Stuyvesant, uh, Brooklyn Tech, and a host of other Hunter, a host of other very well endowed and supported schools, which virtually means that certain kids uh, don't have a prayer of ever getting a Regents degree. Um, how could this uh, lawsuit start to address this issue? Of uh, uh, I'm a working parent in Bushwick or in Bedford-Stuyvesant or the South Bronx. Uh, I don't have, you know, access. Um, I'm work, both my, you know, spouse and I are working two jobs. We're doing everything we're supposed to do. And we just happen to be near schools that are just not performing well for our kids. How could the lawsuit help, out, help us? Well, I think it comes back to the question we were dealing with earlier, and that is the question of targeting. And how do we target those schools that are most in need? How do we identify those schools that have the highest number of students in special education, who have the highest number of kids on free or reduced lunch? And then how do we make sure that those schools receive the disproportionate share of funds to which they are entitled? If you look across the city, there 75 percent of the students are um, at the poverty level. And we want to make sure that those students, particularly ones in those schools in which there's a concentration of low performance, that those schools are receiving a significant portion of the pie. And that also gets into the accountability question. Uh, when some years ago my organization looked at, at really poor performing stu uh, schools, <clears throat> there seems to be a high correlation of many more substitute teachers, many more per diem teachers, most teachers teaching outside of their own disciplines. And actually the better performing, higher uh, uh, sort of higher income areas of the city don't have those kinds of problems. That's not universally show, so, but there does seem to be some correlation uh, clearly between the teacher cadre and the poverty of the district they're in. Um, clearly, turning that around will require the teachers' union's help and also new resources. Mm -hmm. uh, the city of New York still has the bizarre function of if you happen to have a lot of uh, very senior teachers, you also get the lion's share of ancillary services. You get a proportionate uh, share of monies based upon what the wage scale is for your teacher group. So it tends to support uh, the better performing schools mm -hmm. which have a more a steadier and, and more experienced teacher core. So clearly there's a lot of work to be done here. Uh, let's talk about uh, the issue, some other issues that have come up in the Commission, which is smaller class size. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a referendum that was conducted that I participated in, along with some of the unions, uh, which got well over 100,000 signatures calling for a, a, essentially an uh, a, uh, amendment to the city charter, which would call for smaller class sizes. Uh, there are testimony that we've received already that seem to indicate enormously high class sizes for certain schools and grades. Uh, what about that? How does that work against this as well? I think a class size along with uh, teacher quality and teacher training and facilities uh, is an issue that we have to address uh, through the lens of providing deferential funding for the existing needs. Um, personally and from a research perspective, I would hesitate to 
um, call for universal class size reduction throughout New York City. Mm. Class size reduction is a very expensive school reform, um, and we have a vast amount of data and experience from other states, especially in California where this has been implemented. Um, and we know that universal class size reduction for all students is a very expensive uh, reform. Um, I think we would have to approach this wisely and again address those schools that have the highest needs with some of the highest classrooms uh, and implement class size reduction accordingly. Laura, let's talk about another issue, which is uh, is like to pay for this. Is likely to be some change in statewide uh, revenue sources and taxation potentially. How are we going to get the rest of the state to go along with this uh, idea if they're not going to see any changes in money going to their to Albany and Buffalo or living in a rural area? And I got trouble with my schools too. Why should I help pay for New York City? Right, and I think that the answer to that is we're not going to see a change unless we do see benefits throughout the state. And I think that that's why the legislature got stumped over the summer, because they recognize that you really can't provide a benefit exclusively to one part of your state, even though it's a disproportionate size of your state. You have to take into account that there are funding problems throughout your state. So I think we're going to be back in the field of having, how to come up with a solution that's going to benefit jurisdictions that are currently being underfunded throughout the entire state. And obviously building consensus, I mean, the, the, the legislature's in action. It doesn't bode well uh, for this being a quick um, fix. Mm -hmm. uh, the, we hope, obviously, to see the judge rule. Uh, how soon can New Yorkers, or both in New York State and New York City, expect these monies to be rolled out? Do you have any suggestion, mm -hmm. Professor? I don't think we know the exact uh, uh, answer to that, and I think that's an answer that we're all going to be wondering about over the next several months. I do think that the political challenge that uh, is before us is going to be enormous uh, in sorting out the needs of different constituencies that have been involved in this case for almost 10 years um, and trying to begin to address these needs to allocate the dollars and so forth. Um, but that is a, uh, a question that that is yet to be determined. Isn't this going to require an enormous amount of legislative will and courage? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. And we are talking about New York State, are we? Okay, I, I, I clearly, uh, you know, we haven't seen that kind of unity of purpose. This isn't uh, blaming one house over the other, but clearly they seem to be almost in camps now. There, there's very little unity in terms of purpose I think it's between the, the governor's state, uh, the state assembly and the Senate. Well, I think that what we could begin to see, which would be an unfortunate solution, is that this time if the legislature doesn't follow the court's order, there may be contempt in proceedings, in which case we may see something like what we saw at Yonkers, in which... And what happened? <laughs> tell, tell the viewers briefly. <laughs> well, that, uh, this, that the city of Yonkers was sued thousands of dollars a day uh, because they failed mm -hmm. to desegregate their school system. And so would we see something happen at the state level? It would be... I, I couldn't even... Un uh, uh, envision what the sanction would be that would shake this government up. Mm -hmm. um, it would be, obviously, the Yonkers can be taken by the scruff of the neck and sh shaken. Uh, what sanction, other than incarceration, uh, could you come up with for the leadership of the Assembly and the Senate mm -hmm. and the governor? It, it's, an, it's a fascinating, I, clearly this is going to be on everyone's uh, minds in the next couple of months and, and weeks, but uh, it, it clearly is going to be a challenge that it's going to affect people. And as, as an organization and leading an organization that uh, tries to defend the poor, this is perhaps the most critical uh, undertaking uh, with the incredible outcome, you know, negative outcomes for poor children and uh, working people of having an education system that doesn't prepare their kids. If this doesn't work out well, I think uh, we can look not look forward to a very happy future for anyone in the city. I agree. My thanks to Melora Sockett, Deputy Director of the Special Commission created by the New York City Council, and Professor Luis Huerta from Teachers College of Columbia University. I'm David R. Jones of the Community Service Society, and thank you for watching The Urban Agenda.
To learn more about the work of the Community Service Society of New York or to comment on the urban agenda, please contact us at 212-614-5425 and on the web at www.cssny.org.